Hi, everyone. This is Heather Box from The Million Person Project. And The Million Person Project is a global project about love, storytelling, and connecting change makers. And I am very excited today to be here with Marshall Gantz, who has been one of the biggest influences in Julian and I starting The Million Person Project. And I am excited to nerd out with him today about the power of stories. So welcome, Marshall. And can you introduce yourself to our viewers? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Heather. Uh, it's great to have this time with you. I know how much uh, work you've been doing over the last few years developing uh, people's understanding of the value and use of storytelling, and it's great. So it's great, great to be here with you. I teach uh, at the Kennedy School, but before that, I was an organizer for 28 years, and uh, I think uh, probably the, a consistent theme running through all those various sequences has been a focus on enabling people to claim their own agency by changing themselves and the world around them, whether it was through organizing or through teaching uh, or through the kind of work that we do. Cool. Yeah, and I'm curious about how you see stories related to people claiming their own agency. I think agency is the subject of stories. In other words, I think the structure of story is a way in which we learn to exercise agency. And what I mean is that at the heart of a story is a moment of threat, which either turns into fear, in which case we run from it, or turns into challenge, in which case we engage with it. Mm. And, and so essentially, a moment of plot is a moment of challenge. It is a moment in which we have to deal with the unexpected, we have to deal with the unpredictable, we have to deal with, by definition, for that which we are not prepared, which is what agency really is about. It's not, when, when the rules are clear and we know what to do, that's one thing. But so much of human life is not that. Mm. And, and it's how to handle it. And so story has turned out to be, uh, because we can empathize with the protagonist of a story, we're able to experience its content, not just uh, draw a lesson from it like taste makes waste. We're able to actually experience the, the content of the story emotionally. And emotion is really what the issue is. Mm. Because in order to think strategically about what's in our interest, we have to find ways to access the courage to avoid reaction like fear does, to be able to respond purposefully. And so that means like, how do we learn to access the kind of hopefulness, the kind of sense of self-efficacy, the kind of, of, uh, of solidarity that enables us to find courage? Well, when we identify with a protagonist in a story, because we're experiencing that protagonist, what the learning we're doing is not just propositional intellectual claims, the heart is learning because we're there and we learn to strengthen our heart through the experience of our way in which we participate in story. So the moral a story teaches is fundamentally to the heart. Mm. That's why 85% of the time parents spend with young children is in storytelling. It's instructions. It's instructional. Um, it's instructional in how to become a choiceful human being. Uh, it's why faith traditions teach through stories. It's why culture. So it's one of the fundamental ways in which we learn to access the emotional or moral resources we need to be able to exercise agency and respond to challenges as opposed to react to them. And that's why it's so important. And how did you come about developing this? What what were your influences? How did how did public narrative curriculum come to be? Well, I mean, there's probably a long story, so to speak. But no, I mean, I grew up in a story tradition. My father was a rabbi. My mother was a teacher. Uh, I grew up in a community in which story really defined a community more than physical place, more than geography. More, It was like being a character within a story told generation after generation. That was where I acquired you know, a lot of sense of, of who, who I am. Uh, we moved around a lot and so was always kind of marginal to the various communities that we were in. And so there was this sense of uh, 
who I was was tied up with the with this this narrative, but then again, there was a lot of dissonance uh, with the world around and so forth. You know, I wouldn't have articulated it that way then, mm-hmm. but when I found my way to what was going to be my calling for many years, it was in as an organizer in the civil rights movement, and that was an interesting way in which someone whose life experience had been very marginal like my own could turn that position into a source of agency. In other words, an organizer empowers themselves by empowering others. Mm -hmm. And as an outsider in the civil rights movement in the South, there was a role I could actually play that was a powerful one because it rested on empowering others. And of course, the context in which we did that was the black civil rights movement. And I mean, I grew up on the Exodus story. Now I was getting to live it. The movements I found myself in in were very rich in narrative, very rich in story. And because they had a strong cultural content, they weren't just like, what's the strategy to get $5 an hour? It was like, you know, who are we? We are transforming our understanding of ourselves as we transform the world around us and they're linked together. My story and the story of my world are connected. When we had campaigns, we always had a story, a strategy, and a structure. In other words, what's the narrative of the campaign? Why does it matter? What's the strategy of the campaign? How are we going to do it? What's the structure? How do we organize ourselves to make it happen? The way you can think of it is that both strategy and story are two different ways of dealing with the unexpected. Strategy is the cognitive way. It sort of figures out how do I use my resources to deal with it? And story is the emotional way. How do I find the courage to deal with it? And so they're, they're, they're complementary. So I did this work on, on strategy, trying to understand you know, why David sometimes wins. And it turned out that one of the key elements was, in fact, motivation, which takes us back to emotion, which takes us back to story. I learned a lot about the relationship of story structure to emotion and the brain and how all that works. Mm -hmm. And when I finished my dissertation, then I wanted to work on stories and social movements. It took me a little while to get around to it. Uh, I wrote a paper on stories. I read everything I could find from all the different fields on narrative. Uh, When my wife Susan died, I was off for a while and came back committed to develop a course on narrative. Mm -hmm. And, but I wanted it to be a leadership, like narrative in the context of leadership. And by that time, I'd begun to think of leadership as being rooted in Hillel's three questions, the first century Jerusalem scholar who says, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? If I am for myself alone, what am I? If not now, when? And as I was working, trying to design this this module I was going to test, it sort of clicked at one point that that was the point of integration. In other words, Mm -hmm. that it wasn't just telling a story of hope, which we knew in the farm workers was what it was, but it was telling a story of self. Mm -hmm. And it was also telling a story of us. And it was also telling a story of the present moment that turns it into a moment of story. And so those things just kind of came together. And I tried it as as a class. I thought 15 people would show up and 35 did. And that was right around the same time we were doing work with the Sierra Club on a project where we got to test it. And that was just a little bit before the Obama campaign where we got to test it. And it turned out that this um, really worked. Mm. And so the last fall I taught the class here, we have 130 students from 30 countries. And we've now done public narrative work in, in Japan, in China, in the Middle East, and all over the place. So I don't think the self us now was an invention. I think it was a discovery. Mm. In other words, I think that people, that's how people put together, put narrative to service in behalf of leadership is by focusing on those questions. And I think I was just kind of fortunate enough to discover that and then sort of figure it out how to make it more accessible. That's a long story, but that is the story. It's a good story. And that, you know, the part about how you made it more accessible, that's one of the things I'm really curious about. It's like Marshall Gantz in, in my world and in organizing you know, circles around the world is, is a household name. No. Like, how, how did that happen though? Like in a lot, it's like Marshall Gantz, self us now. Oh yeah, you know, 
How did that happen? I don't, it's a good question. I <laughs> no, I I was at the right place. Or, no, I don't know. I mean, look, I mean, I've been doing this stuff for a long. I mean, okay, I've been doing this stuff for a while, but I've also been fortunate to um, find my way to. You know, I did the organizing for many years. And then I left the farm workers and spent a lot of time figuring out what the hell I was going to do. Uh, wound up coming back to school, doing sort of a whole second thing. Now I'm a scholar. But what really always called me was the teaching. And so having a class, because the first year I started my PhD, the Kennedy School asked me to design a course on organizing because I'd been a student here the year before. And so every spring, I would have this opportunity to integrate my life experience with the social science I was learning in a conversation. I thought of it as a conversation with the future, with a rising generation. And so the pedagogy became really central to my learning. Mm -hmm. And of course, pedagogy is about how to make learning accessible. Mm -hmm. And it's not about dumbing down. It's how to make things accessible. And, and, you know, often, I'm sure you've had the experience, you dive into something and it gets very complicated until you work through it. And it turns out that it's actually, actually, there's, there, there, there's a kind of core simplicity to it. If, if you've really gotten there, if you really. Right. And so I had this sort of experiment, this way to experiment year after year uh, in developing a pedagogy that could link these things. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you're working with, stu with students here from all over the world, and so you can't take culture for granted. You have to sort of, you're testing to see, oh, is this cross-cultural or not? I mean, does this, so it's a kind of cross-contextual learning setting. And then, you know, being connected back to the world of practice, you, you try things. And the model that we developed for teaching this was like dependent on coaching. In other words, um, it wasn't like the guy gives a lecture and then everybody does their thing. It's like um, four, four dimensions. Uh, explain what's the theoretical understanding. Model, here's what it looks like. Practice and debrief. But the practice is coached because people will not on their own usually go to the places of tension they need to go in order to actually develop and, and dig deeper. I mean, there's a theory of zone of proximate development about that. And, and, and so coaching has been central to the, the pedagogy. Well, that means that you are constantly training people. And so anytime we do a workshop, we're training new coaches. Mm -hmm. And so then they decide that they'd like to do this. So then they go on and do it. And, and that also allows you to resituate it culturally. So we have a team now that can teach all this stuff in Mandarin. We have a team that can teach it all in Japanese. They adapt, but because it's narrative, as you know from your experience, mm -hmm. it, it's inherently rooted in people's own cultures and experiences. So a woman in Jordan described it more as a roadmap than a blueprint. I just think it's, it's turned out to be a tool that's pretty useful for a lot of people. Yeah, it's been so useful for us. I mean, we have now worked with, you know, 1,382 people from 65 different countries. Yeah. And it's incredible to, to realize that it's such a human yeah. curriculum. It takes time to do the work and it takes support, like you were saying, coaching. Yeah. Yeah. But, but everybody understands the work. Okay. And the, it's the coaching piece that really gets people there. Yeah, no, I, I, and see, when people learn to coach, I mean, they're learning to tell stories, but they're learning to coach, then they tend to really get engaged with it, and they want to share it. The language of story is so uh, concrete and real and personal mm -hmm. that it cuts through all these um, cultural and political barriers. Mm -hmm. You know, when we try to sort of develop philosophy and ideology and all that stuff, it's a whole bunch of categories, but when it gets right down to it, why do we care about what we care about? Mm -hmm. What are the sources of hurt in our lives? What are the sources of hope in our lives? Mm -hmm. And you know what? It's not that different. I mean, yeah, it's different to be in, you know, in, in a place in, in, uh, in Syria where there's all this struggle going on and it, than it is to be in, you know, Cambridge, Massachusetts. On the other hand, as people growing up, 
the fears we have to deal with, the hurts we experience. Mm -hmm. It takes stuff down to a place where we can actually experience empathy with one another that allows us to, to find common values around which we can work together. And it doesn't solve world peace. It's not like doesn't do any conflicting interests and all the rest, but it, it gives us a language of, of values that's experiential and therefore more accessible and more powerful, I, th I think. When I first started, people in Japan working on this, people would say, oh, no, no, this will never work in Japan. Mm -hmm. People don't talk about themselves in Japan. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when you start to practice, it turns out nobody ever asked them. Right. That's what they said. Nobody ever asked me what I thought. Mm. The opportunity to articulate why, oh, it just unleashed and opened up all this incredible moral energy. It's so exciting to watch that happen. And one of the things I'm curious about you as a coach, you know, I've watched you, you coach people before you know, in some of your online learning stuff and through the Leading Change Network and things like that. But one of the things I wonder, when you're the coach, how do you work with people when, when people say, I don't have a story? I'm, I'm just, I just don't have a story. I just, you know, I'm random or whatever it is that, that people say. Probably not unlike you. I mean, say, oh, really? <laughs> oh, well, what are you doing here? What, you know, what are you doing here? Why are you here? <laughs> You just dropped out of the sky? Well, no, I'm here because of X. Oh, well, well, why do you care about that? Mm. Well, I just always have. Yeah? So you came out of the womb with like a commitment to whales, right? I mean, that was like <laughs> on your fur as a little baby whale. And that was, well, no, not exactly. Whoa, well, well, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> you just don't buy it because it's because everybody's got a story. And so... I find a combination of humor and, and confrontation uh, yeah. <laughs> cuts through the, the bullshit. <laughs> and what about when people say, you know, what, what, what about when people say, no, my story is way too sad. It's too hard for other people to hear. I don't want to tell my story. That's harder. That's harder. You have to, I think, be very clear about ground rules. I think you have to be very clear about boundaries um, and you have to make a judgment because there are traumatic experiences that really are um, have to be handled very very carefully there's hurtful experience though that um, benefits from articulation Mm -hmm. and and really benefits not at the time but later and it's interesting the research on this because part of what you're doing you can't change the past but you can change the meaning of the past mm -hmm. and when people begin to articulate experiences of hurt that have had big influence on them but they don't acknowledge that it's like then they are an object to that experience in other words it's influencing them when they become able to articulate it and share it that experience then becomes a resource for them as a subject in other words that goes to agency so instead of this experiencing making me do what i do i now can draw on that experience for what i want to do because i can understand more more clearly i can manage it and make it mine and so, yeah, as you know, uh, often at the beginning, it's tough. People need the space held, and you got to stay with it, and 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 then be be present empathetically, but not let go, not let go. And they and nine times, ninety nine times out of a hundred, they come through. Mm -hmm. And once they make it through that first time, then they begin to be able to actually learn how to how to tell the story. Mm -hmm. They're overwhelmed by it maybe the first time, mm -hmm. depending. But then they begin they begin to be able to own it. And then they're owning a piece of themselves. It's really kind of important. I mean people sometimes say, well is this psychoanalysis or you know, is this uh, uh, therapy? I said, no, you know, uh, in therapy you're often looking for the sources of dysfunction. We're looking for sources of function mm -hmm. because we're looking for moments of hurt as ways of understanding why you care about what you care about, mm -hmm. 
not what's wrong with you, but why you care about. And then we shift to what's often even more elusive, which is, so where'd you get your hope? Mm-hmm. Well, what do you mean? Well, you wouldn't be here if you didn't have a source of hope. Where's that? Oh, I never thought about that. Oh, well, that's where the mom's come. Well, or whatever. Yeah. But I mean, it's often, often people can articulate the hurt faster than they can the hope. Mm. And, and identifying those sources of hope then becomes, wow, yeah, that's right, isn't it? Oh, that's cool. Mm-hmm. So that's what I mean about developing agency. Mm-hmm. You, you become then able, these experiences then become a resource for you in your engagement with others rather than influences upon you mm-hmm. as you try to engage with others. You know, sometimes that transition point can be hard, but I, I love that transition point between story of self and story of us because yeah. I, I just feel this expansion in the room of, oh, I get it. Like this story has direct power to influence the things that I care about the most, yeah. you know? And I see how this is in relationship to other people besides me. And that's a really cool moment to watch for me with people. That sense that we are in this together and you are able to make that experience happen. Boy, that's pretty cool stuff. Yeah. It's really cool stuff. One of the things that I'm curious to ask you, as someone who's been you know, in the organizing world for so many years, is in what ways do you see history repeating itself right now and in which ways are you seeing things that are totally new i guess i don't think of it as a circle but more as a spiral i mean uh so you know there are things that look familiar but they're not they're not the same they can't be the same because the past is the past and the present is the present and they're not the same there's a zen concept called shoshin like beginner's mind means like sort of approaching everything with a fresh mind like like open to learning, like like new. I don't think history repeats itself. We are struggling to do the best we can to make a world that's as livable and as hopeful as it can be. And yeah, we have we go backwards, we go forward, we go up, we go down. Tools change, context change. The human heart doesn't change that much. Um, you know the ways in which we need to make meaning don't change that much. I think the spirit of the new is is precious. And I think that generational change is so important because it poses new questions, it keeps us learning, it demands that we learn. And I mean, that's our strength as a species, is our capacity to learn. I love that idea of a spiral. I think of that in my own spiritual practice is I come across that a lot. Like, wait, what? I'm back here. And then I'm like, oh no, I think I'm at a different angle. Like, I think I may have gone to a different part of, of the spiral and I actually am seeing things yeah. differently, but it looks kind of similar to what I saw before. <laughs> it's so interesting, Heather, in the narrative process that we are often in our lives go back to go forward. It's like, you know, here we are now. Now, wait a second. How do we get here? Let me go back and figure that. Oh, oh, it looks different to me now. Oh, but now I see what I didn't see then. Mm, that equips me to go forward. And I think narrative is a, you're doing that all the time with your story of self. You're going back and you're accessing resources so as to be able to make choices in the present to go forward. And I think that's kind of the rhythm of things. What would your advice be to someone who's hesitating to tell their story because they're, they're, you know, kind of worried about being exposed? Well, I mean, it's natural, right? I mean, because we, we are taught that the way to, to protect ourselves is to hide things. That is a way to remain fearful. <laughs> uh, it's to then live with the fear of exposure. The thing I worry about is people thinking that telling a good story is itself enough to change the world, and it's not. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, there there is the stories we tell, but there's the strategies we need to use to actually turn resources into the power to create change. And that's politics, and it's economics, and it's 
and and there's the way we need to organize ourselves. So we would always have story, strategy, structure. And the foundation of it is relational. And the result of it is real action in the world. So I worry about story getting lifted out like one leg of a three-legged stool and said, if you just do this, the world will change. No, it won't. But these are important. This is an important condition mm -hmm. that you have a lot of control over mm -hmm. to, to create conditions for changing your world. Yeah. You know, that is so important for me to hear. I feel like that's something that I personally really struggle with because I was so involved in politics before I started doing the Million Person Project. So, you know, like campaign manager kind of, you know, local elections. My shift to storytelling yeah. was, was really seen as me exiting politics. And I tried to articulate that. I don't think that coming into 350.org and supporting them with the climate activist stories in any way is separate from their strategy. Like I, I, I believe that it, it's one tool that helps to build their strategy. It doesn't negate the need for this structure and strategy. Okay, well, thank you so much for taking the time out of your evening to, to speak with us. And uh, Julianne, who you know is the co-founder of the Million Person Project, I, I was like, you know, do you have any questions that you want me to ask Gantz? And he basically listed them all out. And I was like, I already got those on my sheet. But then he, had, <laughs> then he had one question that was not on the sheet, which was like, you have the most iconic mustache in the movement. And <laughs> when was the last time that you had a clean shaven face? <laughs> oh my God, what a wonderful question. Well, I know I did in my high school graduation. Okay, so it's Because I while. have my high school graduation picture and there's no evidence of it. I think I acquired it in college, and I know I had it by the time I was in Mississippi. Okay. So I think it was a strategy to appear older and be taken more seriously, but then it has become an old friend. <laughs> and it, it was very popular in the farm worker movement uh, <laughs> for obvious <laughs> cultural reasons. And so now, you know, now it's a friend. Well, we will definitely include your contact information and your website for our viewers to see. And thank you to our viewers for tuning in. And thank you, Marshall Gantz, for being a part of the conversation. Thanks, Heather. I, and I want to know when the project's done so I can tune in. Okay, yes, I will definitely tell you that. Great. I'll look forward to it, Heather. Take care. Say hello to California for me. Okay, I will. All right. Take Great. care. Bye. Bye.